you're having fun, I can tell. Some of you got a ways to go to get to your seats. The I know we've all been looking forward to this presentation tonight. And it's an important one. And so I asked a person uh, very close to me, someone that I have served on the Boy State staff with for more than 25 years, the person who was the director of the program immediately following or preceding me, excuse me, who helped to make sure all of you seniors that are in the room would have an opportunity, despite COVID, to experience this program. His name is Matt Dameron. Matt, would you come to the stage? Thank you for being with us tonight. And joining Matt here in a moment, gentlemen, is a guest that is near and dear to my heart and the hearts of all of us here at Missouri Boys State. Mr. Herb Kahn. Herb is a... Herb is a titan of the Missouri Boys State program. His tireless work on behalf of MBS and other philanthropic organizations has secured his place in not only the Missouri Boys State Hall of Fame, but as a revered leader in Missouri, particularly Kansas City. Herb Kahn has undertaken many challenges in his life. He's a former chairman of the Gaming Commission, chairman of the Missouri Cancer Commission, and he's been named best rainmaker in Missouri by his fellow attorneys multiple times. In fact, to give you an idea of the status of the man you're gonna hear from tonight, just this week, the Kansas City Art Institute dedicated a building in his honor. It would take, I could go on about Herb, but let's watch what's about a nine minute video that hopefully gives you a little context about Herb and his accomplishments. I think Four of the most engaging words in the English language are tell me a story. And tonight, Herb Kahn is going to tell you part of his story. It is remarkable. It is inspirational. He doesn't tell it very often. And it's important to understand that his story doesn't stop when he arrived in 1947 in New York at age eight, not speaking a word of English. But the trajectory of his story continues in a way that benefits all of us, our community, and our region. And as you come to know this story, you will understand how compellingly correct it is that he received this award. His contributions to our region are immense. They're varied. He has been intimately connected with Missouri Boys, Bur Boys State, and he is the only living person who has a Boys State city named after him, Con City. He has chaired numerous not-for-profit boards, chairman of what is now Village Shalom, the Kansas City Art Institute, you heard from Tony Jones chair of the Missouri Cancer Commission, chair of the Missouri Gaming Commission, chair of the Kansas City Charter Review Commission, the Blue Ruin Task Force for Kansas City Pensions Plans. You get the picture. He has, for each of the last two years, received the Missouri Award for Best Rainmaker in the state. He has served as a trustee for the Richard and Annette Block Cancer Foundation. Herb is particularly proud of his service on the boards of the Civic Council the Starlight Theater, Swope Health Services. And I happen to have personal knowledge of Herb's amazing negotiation skills that resulted in Kansas City regaining control of the Union Station in the 1990s. And that allowed, as you know, for its redevelopment into a science museum 
that is an iconic landmark in our city. And Herb's mediation skills over 15 long months were truly something to behold. In 1986, Eli Wiesel accepted the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo. And in doing so, he reminisced a bit about his experience as a young child and thereafter with the Holocaust. And this is what he said in part. I remember it happened yesterday or maybe eternities ago. And that very boy turns to me now and says, what have you done with my years? What have you done with your life? One person of courage and commitment can make a difference, said Eli Wiesel. Herb Kahn has made an enduring difference. What are we doing with our lives? What are we doing with our years? And I would suggest there's no better place to look for the right example than Herb Kahn. I've known Herb since about 1955. Suddenly, there was this guy at Paseo High School that all the girls wanted to know and all the guys wanted to know, and it was Herb. He was and is kind of a multifaceted star. I mean, the guy was brilliant, charismatic, athletic. What else is there, right? I'd heard of Herb long before I ever actually met him. He had a reputation as being one of the heavy hitter lawyers in town. He was as impressive as what I'd heard that he would be, but in a most subtle and humble way. Herb is the type of a guy who, if you know his character and background of having escaped the Nazis as a child and come to this country, I believe when he was in third grade, he exemplifies a person who is truly grateful for all the gifts that he's been given in his life. One of his gifts is Nancy, his wife, and when Herb was uh, leading to my kitchen cabinet, we always insisted on having breakfast at Herb's house to have discussions, not because Herb was there, but because Nancy was there and she was such a good cook. She's always been at his side, and they also are like a sock and a shoe. They fit well together. I've known Herb for over 20 years and really got well acquainted with him when I was mayor. He was brilliant in terms of strategy and networking, reaching out to potential participants in what we were wanting to do, particularly related to our greater downtown. I think Herb's photography is a silent communion with his subjects. And one of the things I think is really notable in those photographs is the simplicity of them. They're real people who suffer, who live, who die. And I think maybe because Herb lived some of that, I think it made him a more sensitive observer of the human scene and that he was able to forge a relationship without speaking, but by using his camera. been involved in Missouri Boys State for many years. I had the opportunity several years ago to attend a Boys State event with Herb and his wife Nancy. It was fascinating to see the response of all of the other adult leaders in the Boys State effort and also the young men who were participating. It's just one example of so many of how he has something he cares about, is dedicated and follows through in enabling it to be so much more than it might be otherwise. He has made a huge difference, not only in our community, but in our state and beyond. Herb is the model of a human being who is devoted to the best interests of other people and is willing to act on it. He's quiet, he's forceful, he's genuine, he's lifted this community in so many ways and ways people don't even know about. He lives his values, he's the real deal. 
Herb has a set of values that has made a terrific contribution to the community in so many different ways. He recognizes the inequalities that still exist, and certainly based on his own personal background, he knows what it means to be rejected, and he also knows what it is to be accepted to really live out his potential. I can think of no one more worthy to receive the Henry Block Human Relations Award than Herb Kahn for a number of different reasons. One is, is that as mayor, I had the opportunity to interact with social and civic and community leaders all over the city and around this region on a constant basis. No one, no one was superior to Herb. I had the ability to appoint people to specific things that needed to be done that were critical, toiling in the fields without any fanfare. I appointed Herb to a number of those things. Our work on city pensions, our work with children, things like what he did with Union Station back in the 90s was absolutely critical to this city. He's a guy that I actually love. He's a good man, and he's done great service for this city. He's done a lot of things that people won't know about for a very long time, but perhaps tonight they're going to understand how truly great of a man Herb Kahn is. Herb, I, I said all those things just like you wrote them. Um, and uh, I expect to check tomorrow because I'm running low on gas. To the stage, Mr. Herb Kahn. Welcome, Herb. We're about out of time, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not getting off that easy. Um, gentlemen, Friday night at Missouri Boys State is special. It's the night that we pivot and we start to turn our thoughts from what has been to what will be. It's the night that we take all of the energy and the excitement of the last week and think about how to turn that into meaning and purpose. And I can't think of a better speaker tonight than Herb Kahn. He personifies the man of the arena that you've been hearing about all week. And we're just thrilled to have you here, Herb. Thank you very much. So you are, in many ways, Mr. Boy State. You have served in every conceivable leadership position here at Boy State. Former dean of counselors, former director, uh, former chair of the Missouri Boy State Trust, Hall of Fame, namesake of Con City. And we know from that video that there are hundreds of organizations that would love to have your time and your energy and your talents. What's special about Boy State? <clears throat> well, when you, when you listed the uh, positions I've held, you actually left out the most important one. What's that? <clears throat> the one that I enjoyed the most, being an assistant and a city council, assistant city council and city councilor. That's where it's at. That, that's when you are really into the program with the citizens, doing uh, everything that they're doing, you're doing it with them. And uh, even though the other positions you mentioned are important and the program wouldn't run without them, as far as pure joy of being at Boy State, it was being in the city. That's great. Tell us about your citizen experience. You attended in 1955, right? I did. I'm sure all, all of you remember 1955. <laughs> you don't? <laughs> I, I think I sat right over there. I think it was in Lewis City. Great. Uh, <laughs> Lewis City got moved to the back, I see. Uh, so I, I was uh, lieutenant governor in 1955, and uh, before I became lieutenant governor, I was active in my party. Uh, I started at the ward level and city, county, and then I ended up being chairman of the state party, and from there I ran for office. And uh, every step of the way was, was terrific. So what did you take from that week? I mean, how did that influence your career and your life? You, you know, uh, we, we talk about the Boy State motto being a week to shape a lifetime, and it, it probably isn't true for many of you, uh, but it is going to be true for a lot of you. Uh, and it was true for me. I came to Boy State thinking that I wanted to be an engineer. And I was going to go to school back east and, uh, and become an engineer. And I didn't know what was going to happen after that. But I got to Boy State, 
and I signed up for law school, uh, which I enjoyed. And then the director of the program at that time was a lawyer from St. Louis, uh, one of the coolest guys I've ever seen, well-spoken, uh, well-mannered, had complete command of, of the stage when he was on the stage. And I remember thinking to myself, wouldn't it be something if I could be like him someday? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I decided during Boy State that I would, that I wanted to go to law school. And so that, and, and law school is, is what has shaped my career ever since then. So yes, uh, a week at Boy State uh, did shape my lifetime. And we know that week started this trajectory for you into law school, into a career, uh, becoming a leading attorney, one of the very top echelon of leading attorneys in Kansas City. Um, you know, when I think about your career and just the tip of the iceberg that we saw here tonight, you know, one of the questions, I've known you for 20 years, but one of the questions that I've always wanted to ask you is, why have you never run for office? <laughs> uh, that, that's a good question. And uh, I never even came close to wanting to run for office. <laughs> I remember when my career was developing in Kansas City and I was involved in, in various uh, aspects of city projects, uh, economic development projects, uh, Charter Review Commission, investigating the pension plan, which was in bad shape. So I was doing all these things uh, involving the city and, and uh, I was also county counselor for uh, two years when I was 28 years old. Um, but I never, I never wanted to get into, I never wanted to run for office and I never wanted to be in office. I got very close to some office holders and, and was very fortunate that they were all good people. And um, if, if you're, I remember every four years, somebody would call me up and say, are you gonna run for mayor? Are you gonna run for mayor? And the, <laughs> the answer was always very simple. No, I don't wanna be mayor. I don't wanna run for mayor. Uh, I was very happy uh, being behind the scenes doing what I was doing. But I will say this, if you're, if you're thinking about getting involved in politics uh, without being a candidate, it's very important that you choose the candidate that you're going to support. Uh, I happen to make uh, judgments very quickly, and my wife will tell you that probably too quickly. Uh, but I do, and I make judgments about people and about situations and about legal matters uh, almost instantaneously, and, and that's what happened when I met the people that I ended up supporting. I either liked them immediately or I didn't like them immediately. And if I liked them, I said, yes, I will help you. And, um, and I did, and I got very involved. I managed some campaigns, one, well, two in, in the Kansas City area, one in the county, and one statewide. So I, and I enjoyed that. I really enjoyed politics, but I don't think I have the patience to be the person uh, that holds a political office. I don't think I could take the constant tugging on the sleeve of, will you do that? Will you do that for me? Can I do this? Can I, will you come over and see that? Will you go to the, I just, I don't have enough patience to deal with that. So uh, fortunately I was able to do what I did in a way that I wanted to do it and, uh, and never have to actually get into the arena. Now, having said all that, you know, you guys are here because uh, you have been in the arena and if you haven't been, you're probably going to get in the arena so don't let me talk you out of running for office. We need those people. We need people that support people that run for office, but we sure need people that are willing to get in there and be the candidate and be the office holder. So don't let me talk you out of it. That's great. And you mentioned your wife. We would be remiss if we didn't point out that Nancy Kahn is up in the balcony tonight, along with Phyllis Stevens. Thank you, ladies, for being here. So gentlemen, we could, I mean, we could commit an entire week to talking about Herb's career and his accomplishments. Um, they are lengthy, and, and it's not a stretch to say that Herb, over the course of his life, has been one of the most influential Kansas Cityans out there, especially when you consider that he's never held office. But that's not the focal point for tonight. That's not really why we're here. 
And we know that every great leader has an origin story, a story that forged in them the will to serve others. And we know that Boy State is part of Herb's origin story. But tonight you will hear the rest of the story, a story that has never been shared at Missouri Boy State before. It is a story of loss. It is a story of tragedy. But it is also a story of hope and survival and the realization of the American dream. So please turn your attention to the screen for the second chapter of tonight's presentation. This evening I'm going to be telling you my story, my story of uh, growing up in the Holocaust, surviving the Holocaust, and coming to the United States to become an American. Those of you who know me are aware that I have not been inclined to discuss any of my personal background in the past, but it is a part of who I am, and tonight I will share this experience with you, and then I'm going to tell you why I'm doing it. I would like to begin my story with some family background. My grandparents and parents lived in Furt, which is a suburb of Nuremberg, Germany. Pictured on the screen is the family home on the occasion of a wedding. The picture includes my grandparents and my mother. The home was the center of gracious hospitality and culture. My grandmother is wearing her favorite pin. I mention that because Nancy is wearing that very pin this evening. My mother's family owned a children's book publishing company. My father, who had a law degree, owned two electrical part factories. Life was very, very good. Then Hitler came to power, and life changed for all Jewish people. My grandfather was forced to sell his lucrative business for the equivalent of $100. My father lost both his factories. My sister was born in 1934. At that time, my mother was 24. My father was 36. Two years later, in 1936, as Hitler's anti-Semitism was on the rise, my family decided they needed to leave Germany. They chose to go to Holland, which seemed to be a safer place, because, well, it wasn't Germany. That proved to be a mistake, because Hitler and the Nazis marched into Holland and took it over without, without ever firing a shot. Life for Jews in Holland was no different than it had been in Germany. All Jewish people over the age of six were forced to wear a yellow armband with the Star of David prominently displayed. Jewish people were no longer allowed to eat in restaurants. They were not allowed to go to movie theaters. And although they were allowed to ride on public transportation, they had to stand even if there were seats available. Two years after my family moved to Holland, I was born. So I was born in Amsterdam. My early life was, as you can imagine, the only one I knew. My first bed was a dresser drawer. I soon began to learn an important lesson, which was to accept whatever was handed to me without question. My parents and grandparents were strong and loving, and in subsequent years, this strength, love, and courage allowed me to live what appeared to me to be a normal life. For example, I was not aware that I had no toys. I was not aware that going outside to play was not an option. When I was four, a family decision was made to move again, this time to Switzerland, which was a neutral country. The plan was to cross the border from Holland to Belgium and then take the train from Brussels to Zurich. The border crossing trip was to be made by bicycle, with me riding on my mother's bike and my sister riding on my father's bike. I was told that on the trip, I was to behave and to say nothing. And even though it was summer, I remember having on three layers, which included an outer jacket on which the buttons had been replaced by gold coins wrapped in cloth. I still have one of those gold coins. My grandparents were to travel separately and meet us in Brussels. Well, things did not go as planned. We were stopped at the Belgian border and arrested. We were told to follow the German soldiers to, to the uh, police station on our bikes. The person who had been our guide up to that point was taken away, and we never saw him again. My parents hoped that with the payment of a fine, or a bribe, if you will, the Germans might let us go. But unfortunately, we had no Belgian money with which to pay such fine. So on our journey to the police station, my mother whispered to me to get ready because we were about to fall off our bicycle. 
And we did, and I still have a scar on my leg from that fall. While my mother pretended to have fainted and was lying on the ground, my father went into the farmhouse in front of which my mother had chosen to fall. He exchanged some Dutch money for Belgian money. It was obviously a usurious rate, but the scheme worked. My father paid the fine, and we proceeded on our way to Brussels in Belgium. However, the delay at the border caused us to miss our train to Switzerland, and as a result, we remained in Belgium for the next four years. As we had done in Holland, we moved countless times, living primarily in attics and basement. Some people took us in because they thought it was the right thing to do. Other people took us in because we paid them. My mother and grandmother worked for the people who took us in by cleaning their homes, and they performed odd jobs. I remember one of them being the scaling of fish. We remained in hiding for about four years, and I continued to accept this as that's just the way it was. The primary difference between uh, our experience and the Anne Frank experience was that we continued to move around while the Frank family stayed in one place in Amsterdam. It was during that time that I developed traits which are still with me today. For example, the Germans had developed a weapon which is called the V-2 bomb. The V-2 bomb was rather crude compared to weapons later developed. The V-2 bomb would travel for a certain number of miles, then the motor would stop, then the bomb would fall and explode. The traveling V-2s were very noisy. So if we heard the noise above our house, we knew we were safe because the bomb was still moving. If the noise stopped, we knew we were in harm's way because it was about to fall and explode. Because most of these bombs came in the middle of the night, I learned to sleep on the edge of my bed so I could be ready to run to the basement from the attic when the V2 noise stopped. The basement in one house had a coal cellar, which must have been considered the safest place to be. However, the coal cellar was very dark and very tight and very claustrophobic. To this day, I still sleep on the edge of my bed and I am still claustrophobic. We never had much food, sometimes no food, and certainly no desserts. I had not seen nor heard of ice cream. I do remember getting a special treat for my birthday one year, which was a piece of bread lightly covered with margarine and sprinkled with a little sugar. As my grandchildren know, in my today's world, I can never have too much ice cream. Thus, their name for me is Papa Ice Cream. One day in Brussels, my grandfather took a bus which was stopped by the Nazis. Everyone on the bus was searched, and even though my grandfather had false identification, he was taken to prison. We never saw him again. I'll speak more about my grandfather a little later. In 1944, having apparently run out of places to hide in Brussels, we moved to a small country village in Belgium called Rosière. In Rosier, we lived in the basement of a farmhouse and remained in hiding. Somehow, my mother made contact with the priest of the local Catholic church in the village, told him about our situation. By this time, my sister and I both spoke fluent French as well as Dutch, and the priest allowed the two of us to openly go to Catholic school in the village, which was run by the church. Only the priest and the nuns at the school knew our true identity. My sister and I went to school every day and to Catholic Church on Sunday. We used the last name of Peters. I have no idea how that name was chosen, but as I indicated earlier, I had learned by then to accept what I was told without asking questions. Let me pause here and say that because of that experience, I've always been grateful for the kindness of the Catholic Church. In fact, some years later, two of the nuns from that church in Rosier came to Kansas City to visit my family. It is out of my respect and appreciation for the church that I asked my good friend Father Curran to offer the invocation this evening. So it was in Rosier, while living with the last name of Peters, that I learned some things. I learned to keep my head down and never call attention to myself. It was also in Rosier that I learned that even though my legs were not long, I was able to run fast. I mentioned running fast as that was to become important in later life what had earned me a track scholarship to the University of Michigan, where I got my undergraduate and law degrees and found Nancy. More about that experience a little later, too. 
We stayed in Rosier until the end of the war, and we knew the war was over when we saw British airplanes fly over and dip their wings to us. After the war, we went back to Amsterdam and waited for permission to come to the United States. That permission came after two years of waiting, and in 1947, when I was eight years old, we left for the United States on a ship from Stockholm. It was in Stockholm that I had my first stay in a hotel. And I remember the hotel because it had a dining room, and the dining room had a table covered with a white tablecloth. I had no idea such luxury existed. However, when it came to crossing the Atlantic, it was in the steerage compartment of a very old ship. The trip was supposed to last six days, but because of horrible weather, it took us nine days, and I was really sick the entire time. On the last day of the trip, we were allowed to climb out from steerage and go to the open deck. Out in the fresh air, a man who knew I'd been sick gave me a yellow thing. I didn't know what a banana was or what to do with it. He showed me how to peel it and eat it, which I did, and to this day I still love bananas. <laughs> I also saw a beautiful and large statue of a woman with something in her raised arm. This was my first lesson about the Statue of Liberty in my new life in America began. After landing in New York, we stayed in the city for 60 to 90 days while arrangements were made for our move to Kansas City. Kansas City was chosen because our sponsor, Paul Ullman, lived there. Now, while we were in New York, life was not easy. I spoke not one word of English and therefore was unable to communicate with anyone at the school I attended. The school required that all boys wear white shirts. Well, I did not own a white shirt, and so I wore one of my sister's white blouses. I was laughed at and did not know the reason for the laughter, and that hurt. But I really wanted to adapt, and when kids want to adapt, they can and they do. We moved to Kansas City, and within a year, I spoke perfect English with no accent, and it totally blocked out all my Dutch and all my French. What I knew was that I wanted to be an American. By the way, much later in college, I took a course in French, thinking it would all come back. It did not. <laughs> <clears throat> So as I said, it was the Ullman family who acted as our sponsors so we could move to Kansas City, and it was the Ullman family who jobs for both my father and my mother. But for the Ullman family, I would not be standing here today. I also spent several summers working for the Standard Milling Company, which was owned by the Ullman family, and got to know one of the sons, Pat Ullman. It was Pat Ullman some years later who heard that I was engaged to be married and insisted on interviewing Nancy before that marriage could happen. As I recall, she passed inspection. So you've pretty much heard the rest of my story in Irv's introduction and in the introductory video, but I need to add one segment. After receiving my scholarship to the University of Michigan, I also joined a fraternity where I made numerous lifelong friends. I was asked to participate in a number of weddings of my fraternity brothers and one such wedding was in Detroit. Several of my fraternity brothers and I took our dates to a movie theater the night before the wedding. As I walked into the theater and looked across the lobby, I saw the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. I met her and decided she was the one I wanted to marry. It turned out her name was Nancy, and now some 60 years of her being my everything, she's still the one I would choose. So now you've heard a bit of my story. There are probably people in this room who wonder why, after 50 years of not talking about my life, I've decided to do so. Why now? Well, unfortunately, we live at a time when anti-Semitism has returned. It has returned in Europe, and it is back in the United States, and many good people are watching it happen. We see examples of anti-Semitism when it is blatant and easy to see. More often, anti-Semitism is subtle or nuanced and more difficult to identify. And just as they did in Germany and Holland when Hitler came to power, these good people are watching and they say, well, isn't that terrible? And then they say, but I can't do anything about it. However, we know history does repeat itself. Today, the same hatred is there, the same lack of response is there, delivering the same result. My message tonight is that good people cannot just be observers. Doing nothing in the face of any discrimination 
is not an acceptable option. Now, I did not intend for this talk to become a sermon, and if I was going to deliver a sermon about anti-Semitism, it would certainly not be to this audience. This audience is composed of the very good people I just talked about, but there comes a time when very good people need to take a stand, and that time is now. Earlier this evening, I spoke of my grandfather, and I will remember him again now. My grandfather was an extraordinary man. I told you he was taken from a bus in Belgium and sent to prison. From prison, he was sent to Auschwitz. While in Auschwitz, he was able to write letters to my grandmother, and somehow those letters were eventually delivered to her sometime after the war ended. So my closing will be the following translated portion of a letter which my grandfather wrote to my grandmother on the day he knew he was being taken to the gas chamber. Although it is a very personal letter, I'm sharing it with you today because I believe it will be meaningful to all of us. Here's what he said, quote, Today I want to write a word of love for you alone. God knows whether it will ever reach you, but it unburdens my own heart, which heals your suffering hour after hour. I regret every opportunity when I did not tell you how much I love you and how much happiness you have given me. Even though there were differences of opinion or ways of thinking, I would fight for you today with the same fervor as I did 36 years ago. In these days, my thoughts go back to happy memories in our garden and on our trips to the forest. During these very last days, we stay unparted either in our lifetime or if it is time for me to die. Forever and however it will be, my heart and soul will always be with you." End quote. <clears throat> well, my thanks to all of you for being here and listening to my story. May it remind all of us to be loving and kind, to stand up for what is right, and to be courageous whenever a challenge must be met. Thank you very much. story. You referenced this in the video a little bit, but I'm going to ask you again, why now? You know, it's not something uh, you've talked about a lot. It's certainly, you know, you've been part of the Boy State family for decades. That's the first time uh, most of us have heard that. Why now? What, what compelled you to come forward now? I, I think that uh, from, the, from the very beginning of my life in the United States, I was always one to look ahead I never wanted to look back. I knew what was back there. It wasn't good. Uh, I wanted to start a new life in a new country with a new language, with new friends, uh, and I did. And I, and I didn't want to do what I was going to do, whatever that was. I didn't, at that time, I didn't know what, how it would turn out, but, but I knew I didn't, want it, I didn't want it to be because of what I had been. I wanted it to be because of what I was now doing and what I was going to do. So um, I, never, I never lied about it. If somebody asked me where I was born, I'd say Amsterdam, but I wasn't asked all that often. And, uh, and, and if somebody asked me about my background uh, at, at a dinner, uh, I would tell them some of it. But uh, I, I never wanted it to be a factor in what I was doing in America. You know, here at Boy State, um, the Boy State programs in the United States were founded in part as a response to Hitler's youth program. And one of our core values, really the core value here at Boy State, is that while we are nonpartisan, we are very pro-democracy. What, what do those values mean to you, given your background? Well, everything. Uh, and it, it, it's difficult to, to talk about uh, living in a democracy and what the virtues of living in a democracy are because because i want to be careful that i don't get into into a political discussion sure. which, which is not what this is about it, it, it's about it doesn't matter what your party affiliation is this is about being a good person and as i said in the in the speech the speech was given by the way a year ago 
uh, November in Kansas City at, at a uh, dinner where I received an award. And that, that was the first time that I spoke about my background. And, I, and uh, Matt asked me if I would give the speech at Boy State, and I said no. I said it was very difficult to do once, and I wasn't going to do it again. But we settled on sh showing the video and then this uh, form of Q&A, which I'm happy to do, and, and I'm glad that we decided to do it. So trying to get back to answer your question, Matt, um, what happened in, in Germany was a, a horrible thing. The Hitler, Hitler didn't, didn't grab power. He didn't arise out of the ashes and, and take over as a dictator. He was elected. He was duly elected by the people of Germany uh, as the, the equivalent of the, of the prime minister. Uh, and it, it's what happened after that. And, and the, the people... Um, the, the people were upset. The, the, the economy in the 20s in Germany was bad. It was bad here, too, if you recall, in the Hoover years. Well, you don't recall it, but you've read about it. It was bad during the Hoover years, and it was bad during the early Roosevelt years. But it was really bad in, uh, in Germany. And when people are hungry, and they're out of work, and they're standing in bread lines, and they don't know what to do, for their families, and they can't do anything for their families because they, they have no source of income. They're mad, and, and you can understand why they're mad, and if people are mad, they look for somebody, something, somewhere to blame because it's not their fault. It's somebody else's fault. And Hitler provided that out for them. Uh, it's not your fault, it, and it's not just the Jews, by the way. He also blamed the communists, he blamed the socialists, he blamed the gypsies, he blamed everybody Except, except himself. Uh, so, and and you know things are going well in the United States, and they're going well in Europe and in Asia, relatively speaking. Uh, but there are people that are hurting, and so so there are some similarities because the people that are hurting are going to look for somebody to blame other than themselves, and so I, I can I can see it happening again. Yeah, I mean, that's the risk, right? I mean, yeah. democracy is something that can be lost. We can, we, you know, you referenced that uh, Germany was a democracy prior to Hitler rising to power, and that's something that, you know, every democracy challenge, is challenged with on a sort of constant basis. Right. Um, it's easy, I think, sometimes to think about Nazism as a historical problem, as something that happened a long time ago and it was defeated in World War II, and the Allied forces drove Hitler out of Europe. Um, but just recently, we've seen a lot more instances of uh, Nazism and anti-Semitism. I mean, in 2017, in Charlottesville, we saw Nazi flags being pride, uh, paraded through a college campus, chanting blood and soil. Uh, January 6th, uh, the insurrection at the Capitol, you know, this beacon of democracy, we see lots of icons of white supremacy and neo-Nazi groups. And when you see those, given your past, given your history, when you see those, how do, how do you feel? Because those are here, they're here now, today. Well, it's, uh, it, it's scary, because um, you know, I've seen the same thing on television everybody else has. Uh, it, it's scary and uh, And, and it's also troublesome because I don't know what to do about it. You know, I, in that way, I'm like everybody else. I, I see it. I know it's bad. Kind of like when you see somebody bullying a kid. You know it's bad, but what do you do about it? Do you, do you step aside? Do you, uh, do you confront the bully? Do you get in a fist fight? I'm, I'm not suggesting you do any of those things. But, and, and, let, and let me get on my soapbox for a second. Because you guys uh, are leaders in your community. You, you've already shown that or you wouldn't be here. Uh, by virtue of the fact that you've been to Boy State, you're going to be looked on even more as leaders. And when you see something going on, whether it's anti-Semitism, whether it's anti-gay, whether it's anti-black, whether it's whatever it is, if it's bullying, uh, you again, I don't, I don't want you to get in a fight with the guy that's doing it. You'd be amazed how effective you can be simply by saying, I don't want to be part of this conversation. 
or I don't like what you're saying, I'm leaving, and walk away. You'd be amazed the, the impact that that has, just one person doing that. And, and if you could stay and see what happens after you've walked away, uh, you'd see everybody else starting to say, oh, you know, he's right, uh, he sh this guy shouldn't be doing that, and, and all of a sudden it's over. But, but you can't do nothing. Doing, doing nothing is, is not an option for where you are today and uh, with respect to what you're going to be seeing during your early and later lives. Because this doesn't stop just because you're no longer a teenager, you're no longer in college. It, it goes on. Uh, but do something. Don't, don't, don't do nothing. Uh, I read a quote the other day. I told Matt uh, by Eli Wiesel, who you heard Irv Hockaday uh, mention before, Eli Wiesel said, and I just saw this a couple of days ago, that uh, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. So don't be indifferent. Don't go all the way. Don't go overboard, but do something. That's end of, great. That's the end of my so soapbox. I love your soapbox. That's great. <laughs> um, and that's actually a great place, I think, to pause and start taking questions from the audience. I want to get to as many questions as possible from you all. So we'll start over here. I, I can't see. Yeah, I can't see either. So. Is there somebody standing there? Yeah, if you have a question for her, please head to the microphone and we'll, we'll get going. I think they think you are doing so well, they just want you to keep going. I don't think that's right. <laughs> All right, we'll start on this side. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Joy Burke. Uh, here's my question. Um, where, where, where are you? Oh, I'm right on, here. On my right? right. Yes, okay, right. all right. The 20th century was perhaps the fastest century ever recorded. From enhanced technology to frequent tragedy, it seems that the progress and violence of man exponentially accelerated. How did you find meaning in the 20, 20th century, and how do you suggest we find happiness and meaning in an, ever more, uh, in an, ev in an even more fast-paced world today? That's, that's an interesting question. I, I'm, I'm not sure that the pace of the world has much to do with, uh, with our happiness or with the problems we confront. They just happen a little bit faster, uh, but I, I think the uh, underlying issues that people face, whether it's the 18th, 19th, 20th, or 21st century, really haven't, haven't changed that much. We've, we, every century has had its wars. Every century has had its great loves, its, its great theater, its great art. Uh, it, it just, we just see it a lot faster today, just like uh, the, the telecommunications is a lot faster today. But I'm, I'm not sure that I would think it's all that different. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Khan. Uh, I am John Grant from Emerson City. Uh, as someone who has suffered persecution from a government, uh, what do you think the American response to the religious persecution in China should be? <sighs> well, whether it's China or the United States or, or France or wherever it is, or Africa, uh, it should be the same. Uh, I don't think the, that the United States is ever again going to be able to dictate to another country what, it, what the people there should and shouldn't do, whether it's, whether it's China, Russia, or, or our friends. Uh, I, I think those days are gone. And I'm not, I'm not sure that, frankly, the United States wants to do that uh, again. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the result would be. But we certainly can let people know that we don't approve of the anti-human, uh, anti-whatever it is that they're practicing over there. Uh, but we, but we got to be careful, too, because, uh, you know, just last week, or this week, I guess, uh, President Biden uh, complained to, to uh, President Putin about what was going on in Russia, and President Putin said back, yeah, but what about your January 6th uh, hmm. resurrection? So, 
uh, you know, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not lily white. Uh, we're not pure. But that doesn't mean that we can't see and recognize what goes on in some of these other countries and take, and take a strong stand against it. Can we, can we solve it? Probably not. Thank you. Hello, sir. I'm Kaylin Ireland. I'm representing Donovan City. Can, can, you, can you speak a little louder? I want to make sure the people in the balcony can hear you. <laughs> Will do, sir. Thank you. Um, first off, before I start my question, I think I can uh, talk for all the citizens of Missouri Boys State and say thank you for sharing your story and thank you for all you have done for us. Yeah. Can, I, can I respond to that before you ask your real question? Um, what, what I've done for Boys State doesn't, doesn't hold a candle to what Boys State has done for me. Uh, I, I love Boy State. Uh, some of my best friends in the world I got at Boy State, and, and, and they've stayed very close friends for all these years. So uh, I've been involved in Boy State, but Boy State has given back much more than, than I've ever uh, given to Boy State. And by the way, let me, let me say one other thing. I'm, I'm sorry for keeping you from your question, but... Uh, a handful of you will be invited back on the staff next year or the year after. Uh, if you're one of those, don't say no. Uh, it, it'll be, if you think, if you think Boy State was great, uh, being on the staff is truly great and uh, it'll be one of the best experiences, if not the best experience of your life. So say yes. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, don't worry about it, sir. Um, no. I remember it. Sir, in your mind, what is the biggest threat to democracy and how can we defend it? Democracy. The biggest threat to democracy? Is that the question? Yes, yes sir. Okay. Whew. I think, and, I, and this is, maybe I'm repeating myself, but I think it's indifference. I, I think, I think it's, Good people like in this audience seeing not good people do things that you know are wrong. You know they're bad. You know, we, we mentioned January 6th. We, I don't want to go back to that again. But, but you, you see things that you know are bad at your school, in the community, wherever it is. You see things that you know are bad. Don't be indifferent. That's how democracy, if democracy, I don't think democracy is going to fail, by the way. I think, I think we're in good shape overall. Uh, but, but if we have issues, it'll be because good people turn aside and don't do anything. Let me interject. How, how, how much of that indifference do you think contributed to the rise of Nazis in Germany? I, I think it, I think it was a combination of uh, indifference plus, you know, Hitler was a very charismatic person, and uh, by the way, there's a there's an exhibit in Kansas City right now called at Union Station called Auschwitz. Not long ago, not far away. If you get a chance to see it, you should see it. Uh, but they have pictures on the wall of tens of thousands of people standing in in a, a square, worshiping Hitler. You know, and if Hitler says, bow down, they bow. If Hitler says, jump, they jump. I mean, he had that kind of control over them. Uh, so it wasn't just, in that case, it wasn't just indifference. They bought into it. They thought this was a wonderful thing. And, and when, uh, I don't think it was Hitler, but when Kristallnacht came, which you may have read about, where the people of Nuremberg went around and, and destroyed all the Jewish shops and burned all the books, uh, that, you know, that, that was not Hitler leading that parade. They, they took that on to themselves. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it was contagious and it spread, and uh, after a while it just developed a life of its own. All right, this side. 
Hello, Mr. Kahn. Uh, Hello. I apologize for my voice. It's been a long week. Good. Uh, my name is Justin Kennedy. I am from Weir City. Um, you've been through hardships in your life that hopefully none of us would ever experience. Um, and you're a part of a world that's ever changing around you. Do you have any advice for us to deal with the challenges um, of the world around us? Yeah, you're, you know, you're, you're doing it right now. You're doing it this week. You're gonna, you started last Saturday and you're gonna do it till tomorrow morning. That, and, and, and I'm not just blowing smoke at you and saying, oh, you guys are wonderful because you're at Boy State. The, the fact is uh, you have proven yourselves uh, and, and you will continue to prove yourselves. Um, help me with a question, I forgot what it was. How do you uh, face and encounter challenges? Um, I, I told you that I make, uh, I make quick decisions, uh, whether it's politics or whether it's hire, hiring young lawyers in my law firm or whatever it is, I make quick decisions. Um, and that's not necessarily good. Uh, I, I'm not saying that because I think everybody should do that. Uh, I, in fact, I think you should take your time and, and weigh the pros and the cons and then uh, uh, make, make your decision based on the facts as you know them. I, I, I think studying history is a lot uh, that, that will go into that. Uh, history does repeat itself. Uh, there is very little that's going to happen in the future that hasn't happened in some way and at some time in the past. Um, what, one of my, everybody, I think, I hope you guys all read, uh, one of my favorite reading material are, are uh, historical novels because history's kind of dry, if, but if it's written by a, a novelist, uh, but, but they use historical facts, that, that's a great way to to gain what happened in the past, and, and you can either help to make that happen again, or you can help to make sure that that never happens again. But don't, don't ignore history. Thank you, Mr. Kahn. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Devin Whaley from Donovan City. <laughs> And my question is, when and how did you learn about the full extent of World War II and the full extent of Hitler's reign? That, that's a great question, because you think, well, he was there. You should know all about it. Well, I didn't. Um, you know, my, my job was just getting through life one day at a time, one hour at a time. Uh, I didn't have the luxury, if you want to call it that, of standing at 30,000 feet and observing everything that was going on uh, below me. That, that didn't happen. My, my life was, okay, you, you get up and you uh, maybe you eat a piece of bread, maybe you don't that morning. And, uh, and when we're in Rosier, you go to the, to the Catholic school and you keep your head down all the way and you don't draw attention to yourself. And, uh, and then you come back home and we'll tell you what to do when you get home. So um, it, it, it wasn't like I had a view of everything that was going on. I didn't know what all Hitler was. I tell you the truth, I probably didn't know who Hitler was at the time. You know, that was, that was way above me. Uh, my, my life was uh, just getting through, the, getting through the, my time uh, one day at a time. So I, I think it wasn't until way after the war when I came to Kansas City uh, or at least to the United States and probably to Kansas City that I started learning about it. And of course, once I, once I started, I, I read everything I could about it. Uh, and still am, by the way. Uh, I just, just finished another novel about people who helped Jews uh, escape in, uh, in France and uh, Holland. And, then, and there were many, by the way. It wasn't just the the nuns and the priests at the one church that we went to, there were people all over Europe that were, that were helping, and, and not because somebody paid them, but because they, th these are the people that didn't turn away. These are the people that said, yeah, I gotta do something. I, I can't do nothing, and they did. Thank you, sir.
let, let me ask, did your family talk about it? I mean, he, you know, I understand you were young, but your parents, did they convey that to you? Did you was something you talked about as part of your family history, or did you find out later? I, I, I don't remember my parents ever talking about it. I, I think my parents were sort of like I was. Once we got to the United States, it was all about, okay, here we are. We're going to speak English. Uh, we're going to go to to school. We're, we're going to... Uh, you know, we're going to go to work. Uh, at some point, we probably bought a tel. Well, I know we did. We bought a little black and white television set, uh, and and we watched the news in. But it it, it, was, it wasn't about okay. Now we're here. Let's let's review everything that's happened to us uh, for the last ten years. It was more about uh, let's keep moving forward, and uh, you know, and and maybe we maybe you can buy some shoes. And maybe, uh, you know, uh, well, fortunately, I got a track scholarship, so they didn't have to pay for college. But, uh, you know, let, let's do these things that we can looking ahead. And, and that, that's kind of what our life was. And let me say one more thing, because sure. this is something I learned from my parents. Uh, we, we never had debt. We probably had a mortgage on our house but we never bought anything that we couldn't pay for. And, uh, and I think that was a great lesson that, that I learned and, and still uh, Nancy and I live by that. We, we've never bought anything that we couldn't pay for. That's great. Sorry. Mr. Tom, my name is George Fries and I am from Gambrill City. After visiting Holocaust museums in both Germany and the United States and, reali and realizing how poor my formal education on the subject was, what can we as citizens and possibly future politicians do to make sure everyone knows and understands the struggles of Jewish people and other persecuted peoples both today and in the past so we can move forward into a brighter, more equal future for all? Well, that, that kind of says it all, doesn't it? Um, that, that, that's what that's what this is all about, and you know, and, and we've talked about Jewish people and anti-Semitism, but but that's just that's just one of the antis that we're facing today, and I'm not, I don't even know if it's the biggest one. Uh, you know, the the uh, anti-gay uh, movement, which is maybe a little bit better now. I don't even know if it is or not. Uh, the the uh, racial issues that are not better, as far as I can tell. We, we, we've got a lot of anti things to be uh, concerned about uh, and, and, and they're not going to go away without without you guys uh, you guys doing something about it uh, and no you can't you can't turn the country around whether you're a politician or, or just a high school or college student but but you can do something uh, you, you can you can go through life not being indifferent to these things so, again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. You, you don't have to go way out. You don't have to say, I'm going to knock your block off if you don't stop calling my, my friend uh, black or whatever you want, whatever, gay, whatever you're calling him. But, but you certainly can let them know that that's not you and you don't like it and you're not, and you're not going to participate in that discussion with them. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Khan. It's an honor to be speaking with you today. My name is Chris, and I'm representing Carnahan City. A, a wonderful Missouri family. <laughs> yes. Um, my question to you is, have you returned to Europe, and more specifically, your hometown since coming to the United States? And if so, how does it feel? Yeah, that, I, I should have Nancy come down and answer that question. Uh, we have gone back. Uh, many times, I was on a, on the board of a company in Germany for many years, and we went to a board meeting there every May, and, and from there we would go someplace, uh, usually in Europe, but some sometimes someplace else. And, uh, and and you saw a little bit of my photography. I've also taken a lot of photography trips, which are wonderful. Uh, when we can talk about that a little bit later too. So yes, we have gone back and. Uh, when we went to Brussels and uh, Holland, I took Nancy to see some of the places that we had lived in the attic or the basement or wherever it was. And 
you know, it, it, it didn't bother me at all. Yeah, that's where I lived, you know, in this little attic, and that's what's where my little cot was on the floor over there. Uh, but, uh, but it really got to her uh, emotionally. Uh, but, but, for, but to me, it was, yes, that's, that's the way it was. And, uh, and, and it, it, it was interesting, it, it brought back memories, but I didn't, I didn't get upset uh, about it, and it didn't, it didn't change my view of, of anything that, uh, of my views that had been developed up to that point. Um, so yes, we've been back, yes, we, we saw a lot of the things that, uh, we, that we went through, we even went to Rosier. Uh, and we found the, the school that I went to and the church that I went to. We couldn't find the farmhouse, which I, I think we couldn't find it because it probably doesn't exist anymore. It's probably been developed. Uh, but it, we, we've done that, and, and we've looked, and we've remembered. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, it, you know, let's, let's get home and let's move on with our lives. Hello, Mr. Khan. I'm Matt Key, a representative of the Honorable Khan City. Yay! Yay! <laughs> it is such an honor to be speaking with you, sir. Thank you. One thing your citizens would like to know is, what is the most important lesson you have learned in your life that has helped shape your career and who you are as a person today? Matt, you didn't tell me I was going to get asked that question. I didn't know. <laughs> good questions. Yeah, it's a good, very good question. Um, I think the lesson that I've learned is, is that e even though my, my life in the United States has been a, a wonderful life, and you saw that on the on the move, on the uh, video, I've had a wonderful life. Uh, but that doesn't mean that every moment of every day has been wonderful. And I think what I've learned is, and, and maybe, this, maybe this goes back to my childhood in Europe, uh, that when, when you plan to do something or you think something, is gonna, something good is gonna happen and it doesn't happen, you pivot from that moment or from that event, from that whatever it is, you pivot to, to something else that will be good, you don't dwell on it. You don't dwell on, oh my God, how did this happen? It's the worst thing that's ever happened in my life. You move on. Uh, because not everything, you, you guys have probably had pretty good lives too so far. And you're probably gonna have pretty good lives. But that doesn't mean that every moment of every day is gonna be wonderful. You're gonna have some bad stuff happen to you. And, and the best thing I can tell you is, when that happens, don't dwell on it, pivot. Move on to the next thing. I, I think that's maybe my best advice. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, hello, sir. It's such an honor talking to you tonight. Um, my name is Ian Mannings, and I am from Pershing City. Um, when transferring to Kansas City, what was it like to uh, adapt there once you got there? Was it easier than adapting in New York? Uh, it, it was easier for several reasons. One, because by the time I got to Kansas City, I'd picked up a few words. You know, I could say okay uh, and thank you. Uh, I, I still didn't speak the language very well. And I remember uh, I got here in third grade and, and my third grade teacher made me, uh, at Christmas time, I had to sing Christmas songs in, in Dutch or French, I can't remember which, and maybe both. Uh, but but the, peop the people in Kansas City were very nice. Uh, you know, there, there's Kansas City nice, as we call it, or Midwest <laughs> nice, as we call it, right. and then there's New York, New York, and they aren't the same. Uh, so coming to Kansas City, the Midwest, if you will, uh, what was a good thing for us, and it was a good thing for me. Uh, I remember some kids in third grade offered to help me learn to read after school, because I really couldn't. 
And so I remember sitting on, on somebody's uh, stoop and uh, with, with a book, uh, you know, not even a third grade level book, probably a kindergarten level book, and, uh, and they were teaching me to read. Um, the other thing that helped me, I think, is uh, I've mentioned before that I was able to run fast, and I, and I was. So, uh, you know, in, in, in grade school, you have recess, and at recess, you do stuff that involves running. And uh, so I, I attracted some good attention uh, by being able to run fast, and, and I think that helped me overcome other things that were going on. But, but uh, yeah, Kansas City compared to New York was, uh, was, was very different and, uh, and very good. And it didn't take me long to get to love Kansas City. I still love Kansas City. And we've lived in other places uh, and spent a lot of time in other places. <clears throat> but when that plane lands in Kansas City, I feel good. <laughs> Hello, I am Ricky Fishbeck from Emerson City. My question for you is, due to America's new standing in the world after the insurrection, how do you feel that may affect democracy around the globe? That's a, I don't know if I know the answer to that. Um, I, I, I think uh, it, it, it certainly didn't help us, um, but I, I think maybe, I, I don't know, I think maybe, you know what? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not, I'm not going to guess at an answer that I don't know. So I, I don't know. I don't know what impact that will have on other democracies. I assume that they've got bigger things to worry about than what we do over here. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't know. It certainly didn't help. Uh, thank you for being honest. Thank you, because a lot of people would just say it. So thank you for being very honest. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Khan. Uh, my name is Henry Holden, and I'm representing Crowder City. Yeah. During your speech last November, you stated many facts that would make it seem as though you left a part of yourself back in Europe. For example, you spoke mainly English after arriving here. You truly wanted to immigrate and integrate into American society. Do you feel that you have disconnected from any part of your former life in Europe? And if you do, do you regret it? And to what extent did the trauma of Nazi rule cause that dramatic shift? You guys ask really good questions. <laughs> uh, I, I, when, we, when we travel back to Europe, especially if it's to Holland, um, you know, I feel like you know, this is where I was born. I, sh I should be able to connect to these people. I can't even talk to them. I mean, when I say that within a year of being here, uh, I blocked out my Dutch and my French, I mean, I blocked it out. I mean, it was like I never spoke it. Uh, and, and you heard in the video, I took French in college thinking, well, there's an A. Uh, <laughs> didn't happen. I was like everybody else in the class. Uh, so I, I feel, um, I think I feel more like an American visiting in Europe than I do as somebody who used to be a European. Uh, and, and is that good, is that bad? I don't know, but I, I think I've become so Americanized that uh, going back there, I don't feel like this is where I used to be. Well, I, I, well, I, I know this is where I used to be, but I don't, I don't feel like th this is my country. I feel like United States is my country, and I'm, I'm just visiting uh, over there. I Thank think you, that's Mr. how Khan. I feel. Hello. Uh, my name is Josh Wilson. I'm from Weir City. Uh, before I ask my question, I just want to say uh, what an honor it is to have you speaking for us tonight and to be able to ask you this question. Uh, so, thank you. Not, 
Um, Nazism, and by extension, white supremacy, is objectively one of the most dangerous ideologies that has ever had a grip on humanity. The internet has been crucial in pulling more and more people down that dangerous, dangerous path in recent years. What do you believe is the most effective way for young people, like all of us here, to actively combat extremist propaganda online or to pull others away from that place? Uh, um, I wish you could ask that question in Washington to uh, all our representatives and senators who are there, because they can probably do a lot more about it than I can. Um, I, I think uh, I think a, I think a lot of that of the white supremacy is based on lack of knowledge, lack of information, uh, lack of knowledge of history. Uh, I, I think I think if, if there is some way that we could teach all those people uh, the, the history of other movements that have resembled them. Maybe they weren't exactly the same, but they were like that. And what happened to those people? Because they don't last. They don't last long at, at all. Uh, you know, and, and something else may come up. But but the, these movements come and go. And you're right. The uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the, uh, the speed of communication today, and uh, all the, all the social media and, and cable TV that, that everybody watches. You know, you you can you can kind of, and I'm sure they do this. They, they find those sources that agree with them, and they're out there, and, and, they, and they just amplify what they already believe or what they think they believe, and, and it feeds on itself, and, and it just gets worse. But they go away. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of Joe McCarthy, who you, you probably, may, maybe you've read about him, maybe you haven't, but he was a United States senator who went after communists. And... Uh, he said, we have communists all over. We have communists in Hollywood. We have communists in the, in the United States Senate. We have communists in the Department of Justice. We have communists in the State Department. And he went on and on and on. Well, we didn't, but the people that believed him, they didn't have the social media then, but it was the same type thing. They, they bought into it and they fed on it and they talked to each other and went on and on and on and became a, a vicious cycle. Uh, but he didn't last. Uh, and, and these guys aren't going to last either. Thank you so, thank you so much. All right, we'll do one more question, then we'll wrap up. Go ahead. Uh, uh, hi there. My name is Mason Gates, and I represent Clark City. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for sharing your story, and second of all, I'd like to say thank you for hiring my mom many years ago. Uh, also, oh well, wait I'm, a minute! <laughs> Who's your mom? Uh, her name is Stacy Gates. She oh my a... God! <laughs> you got a great mom. <laughs> Thank you. Do you believe the USA is the greatest country in the world, and if so, why? You know, there, there's a video on YouTube that's circulating where, uh, who's the actor that played in the newsroom? And then he went on to play uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. I, I can't think of his name. But uh, there's a video of what you should look up of him being asked that question by a college student. And, and he goes off on a rant about how the United States is not the greatest country in the world. It used to be. Uh, and, and he goes on and on and on and gets very specific about where we rank in education, where we rank in this, where we rank in that. And, and, he, and he makes a, a compelling argument about why it isn't. And then, of course, he ends it by saying, but we can be again. Uh, I, I don't share that view. I think the United States is the greatest country in the world. Uh, <laughs> But I think we've got to be real careful about some of the things that we've been talking about tonight because, you know, Rome was the greatest country in the world. There are a lot of, lot of countries. Uh, uh, Genghis Khan was the... There are a lot of people that, that, were, that were the greatest in the world at one time or another, and none of them lasted. Uh, the United States has lasted a long time, but we've got to be careful. Thank you.
Can I make one more? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, of course. I want to go back to the previous session uh, that, that when Matt and I were talking about uh, what, what you can do. Uh, I, I te we, you, heard, you heard the reference to my being a rainmaker. Rain, and for those of you who don't know the term, rainmaker is somebody who, who brings in business, who develops business. In, in my case, it happened to be the law, but it can be in any field. So some people are rainmakers and some people aren't. And, and I teach rainmaking, have done it for about 12 years now. And, and one of the things we talk about that rainmakers do that non rainmakers don't do is listen. Uh, we say rainmakers listen at 90%, and non rainmakers listen at 50%. So I want you guys to remember that when you're, when you're having a discussion, whether it's a business conference or whatever it is a political discussion, listen to the people that are talking. Don't think about what question you're going to ask next. Listen to the people that are talking and, and then respond to them. And if, if there's a discussion going on where your opinion is going to be asked for, don't jump into it immediately and say, Bye, I think that. Uh, the longer you wait, the longer you withhold with your opinion, the more powerful your opinion becomes. So... Uh, those are just two little tidbits uh, I want to give you. And by the way, on the, on the listening, I say uh, people listen at 50 percent. Unless you're talking to your parents or your girlfriend, then the listening goes down to about 10 percent. Well, guys, that's, that's a great place to end our evening. Herb, thank you. You have been a stalwart for Missouri Boy State <laughs> for decades and decades and decades. And for you to come here tonight and share this story is just truly remarkable and it's exactly what these guys need to hear. And it's yeah. a great way, a great way to end this week and be a capstone to your session at Missouri Boy State. So thank you, Herb. Well, thank you all for letting me do it. Gentlemen, I promised you an incredible evening. Bless you. <laughs> and I think that's what we just had. That was a moving story. As Herb explained, it wasn't an easy story to tell. That's why we showed you the video. But we wanted you to see it because it's an important story for all of us to hear. Our country is almost 245 years old. And sometimes it's easy to think that it'll always be here. That it'll always be the same. But our democracy is not guaranteed, gentlemen. It must be protected. And if there's one theme that I want you to take away with you this week, is that it is up to all of us in this room to bend ourselves to the task of ensuring that our democratic processes and that the shared values of our great nation live on for another 250 years. Herb Kahn has put himself to that task. He stepped into the arena so that the young men in this room could inherit a country where a youngster to come to our shores speaking no English and through hard work, perseverance, and determination achieve great things. And now it's your time to continue his work. Guys. And, and I pause there not, not to draw your applause, though I appreciate that you support 
that message, but to give you an opportunity to reflect on what you just saw, what you experienced this week. And so what we'll do next is I want our video guys that you've seen work tirelessly to document this incredible program that you all put together, have one more video for you. And then we're going to turn it over to your final episode of local news. Which I know you're looking forward to. And then I'm going to release you to the most important meeting of the week, your final city meeting. So with that, I'll turn it over to their video.